It's good to have you with us again today from Emmanuel Baptist Church. This is Brad Rickard. We are studying the book of Revelation, and we are now in chapter 13. Last week we looked at the person of the Antichrist. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that we do know. What we do know is it's going to be a literal time, a time of seven years where ultimately the Antichrist is going to have full sway over this world under the sovereignty of God. You and I won't be here if we know Jesus Christ, but we have an obligation to share Jesus Christ with people who need the Lord. If you're not sure where you stand or you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, what we're reading about, what we're studying, for you, if the rapture occurs today, it will, it will become your current events. You will face these very things. So I pray that you'll receive Jesus Christ because you love him, because of what he's done for you. But I want us to continue today. I want us to look at the person of the false prophet. He is the enforcer for the Antichrist. He is... He is the propaganda minister. It's probably a good name for him, for the Antichrist. He's the one that, in a way, will be the face of the Antichrist. And yet the Antichrist will be visible and out there as well. We are in chapter 13. And what I want us to see from the text today is this. Everything that the Word of God really has ever said about false teachers and false teaching, uh, about error, um, about lies, about uh, teaching that is against the Word of God, against the character and the person of Jesus Christ. It all comes to a head here in, in the false prophet. It's, it's now personified. It's embodied in the false prophet. He's going to embody everything that the Word of God has ever said about false teaching, about false religion, um, about the world's point of view. And he's going to embody all of that. We're going to see that uh, as we look at this this morning. So what I want to do this morning, as we look at the false prophet as we look at this second beast uh, specifically I want us to look more importantly at what he is doing what he is embodying what he's showing us because what he's revealing is also alive today but it will be embodied in one person and it will be for the purpose of exalting and lifting up the Antichrist and ultimately the dragon behind him who is Satan it's going to be a terrible seven years but you know what we're facing the same dangers today I want you and I to be aware of them. So let's look at that. Let's look at the element of uh, false teaching, false teachers, uh, false religion. Let's look at that today um, and see what we can learn from what we are shown here by John here in the book of Revelation. The first thing that we see is we, is we encounter false teaching or false religion in this world. Things that we need to be aware of, things that we need to have on our radar is simply this. False teaching is, is often feeling driven. It's, it's cause driven. Uh, driven. Um, very much. We're, we're in a culture that's very much about causes. Um, whether it's climate change or, or whatever it might be, it's, it's, there's always a cause that uh, people are gravitating to, and the causes are often changing, and causes can become life-transforming and life-dominating life that can take over a life. Um, you know, and religions focus and feed on emotions and feed on feelings. Emotions and feelings, they're not wrong. Um, but apart from the character of Christ, our feelings, our emotions, they're all tainted by sin. Uh, I'm thankful for my emotions. I'm thankful for my feelings. Isn't it great to feel? It's a challenge to feel. Feelings uh, move us up and feelings bring us down and emotions are very strong. And God has given those to us, and they're a gift from God. He moves our hearts. He moves our emotions and our feelings. But our feelings and our emotions need to be yielded to, to the character of Christ, the person of Christ, the truth of God's Word. And false religion often focuses and moves the emotion and feeds the emotion. And for those who are driven by emotion and live by emotion, this is such a danger uh, for all of us, emotion affects us all, and we have to keep our emotions in sway. Um, the, anti, the false prophet will come across first as he rises, uh, as he rises to his place of, of, uh, of power, verse uh, 11, And I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Here we had the Antichrist rising out of the sea, a clear reference in the, in the scriptures to the Gentiles out of the earth. Some would say, well, that's a Jew. Uh, I believe for many reasons that's not the case. Simply describing again his, his natural disposition from the earth, out of the earth. Uh, ultimately, uh, one who's tied to, his name is the second beast, tied to the person, 
the work of Satan himself. And so he, he rises out of the earth. He has two horns like a lamb. Well, number one, he's coming across to, to portray himself as, as, a, as a counterfeit voice, representation of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the ultimate Lamb of God. But more than that, when we think about a lamb, we think of gentleness, we think of someone who is a, a, a harmless, someone who is, who's an agent of peace, someone who's benevolent in everything that they do, someone who, who, who portrays an element of humility in what they do. And so you're going to have you're going to have the Antichrist who is out there and who is bold and as brash as he gains power. And initially, you're going to have this false prophet who's going to come across as the soft voice of the Antichrist and the, and the voice of reason in a world where there's chaos exploding all over. And he's going to portray everything that's being asked of the world. It's necessary for the greater good, the common good. Uh, and, and promises will be made, but no intention of keeping those promises. And things will be laid out there, but there will be an agenda underneath, and we're going to see that. And so the false prophet is going to prey on the emotions of the people of the world. He's going to, he's going to uh, twist our emotions and, and, and hold the emotions of people and, and uh, manipulate the emotions of people is what he's going to do. Uh, but first he'll appear to be non-threatening. You know, uh, falsehood always initially comes across as non-threatening, as not dangerous, as it's okay if I dabble in this, it's okay if I believe this. Um, I'm still committed here, but I, I, I won't let this take over. And, and the false prophet's going to have that aura about him. He's going to present things in such a way that it comes across as pl plausible, as reasonable, as good for everyone. And it's best if we all toe the line and if we all come together because the world needs this, he's going to come across as reasonable. He, what he presents is going to appear to be good, uh, transformative for the world, for the globe. And all those things, and and so he's going to come across with that softness and with that humility. With the this is good for the people. This is going to meet practical needs. All these kind of things. And false religion does those things. Same thing. It feeds off of our emotions. It feeds off those things that we want, and it presents to us those things that will pull us and our emotions in that direction. But it does more than that. We're going to see that. Proverbs tells us to be careful. To yield our emotions and our feelings to the wisdom of God. Whoever trusts in his own mind, his own emotions, his own feelings, is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Again, our emotions and our feelings are from God, but they're tainted by sin. You can't trust, I can't trust my emotions and my feelings alone. If I trust my feelings and my emotions, I will make sin decisions in my life because my, I will be feeling driven. And we need to be wisdom-driven by the Word of God, by a relationship with Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 28, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. It's the wisdom of God's Word that, that guides us, delivers us, walks ahead of us, before us, around us. We need the wisdom of God to, to be a foundation to our emotions, to be a grid for our emotions and our feelings. Proverbs 3, 5 reminds us, we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Don't lean on our own understanding, our own emotions, our own feelings, our own points of view. It's so easy to get caught up in what I think, and what you think. And I think that we should do this, and I feel passionately about this. And the, and the false prophet and false religion and, and, and world views and media and all those things, we throw all that in the same pot. The world feeds on our emotions and plays with our emotions continually and puts out and puts out uh, commercials and movies and shows that just feed, and celebrities that just feed on our emotions and drive our emotions. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, we're to take every thought, every emotion, every feeling captive so that we might obey Jesus Christ. If I'm feeling something, I need to yield that feeling. If I, am, if I have an emotion that's welling up in my heart, I have a passion that's welling up in my life, I need to yield that emotion, that passion to the Word of God so that I honor Jesus Christ with that emotion, with that passion, so that I'm careful to put a guard on that emotion and use those emotions and those passions for the Lord. The false prophet is going to feed on emotions. He's going to drive the world and be very emotional in that. As he's doing that, he, he will cover his true intentions. The world covers its intentions. Satan covers his true intentions. Um, sin covers its true intentions. Falsehood covers its true intentions. That's what it does. Verse 11, we continue. 
And I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. See, there's the real character of this false prophet. He will come across pope-like. He will come across religious-like. He will come across as good and benevolent for the world. But underneath, underneath that exterior, underneath that benevolence is a nature, a sin nature, a character quality that, that is demonic and satanic in every way. What he will do is he will drive us toward a person, towards the Antichrist. Falsehood is often very much personality driven and it exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in his presence. And it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And so everything that he does will be driven to draw the attention of the world and its people to the Antichrist. We live in a we live in a personality driven culture. It's all about me. Our TV shows, our entertainment shows, uh, our celebrity star driven culture is all about personality. It's all personality driven. Even religion is driven often by personality. We follow this person and this teacher and and, and uh, uh, this religious leader, and it is all about the person. And we miss that it should be about Christ. Um, the focus becomes the man, the focus becomes the leaders. The scriptures teach us it's not about us, it's not about me, it's about Jesus Christ, it's about him alone. So he's gonna drive the world towards the Antichrist. It'll be very much purpose-driven. That's what he will do. And as he's doing that, he will be he will be hiding the truth we see here. That's what he will do. He will, he will have a hidden loyalty. But see, he's not going to reveal that loyalty. His, his work is satanic. He's not going to reveal that initially. That's not what he's going to do. We live in a world where, where things are presented to us and the truth is hidden from us until it's too late. We're going to see that. Okay, It's very important. Satanic. Another thing that we see that's true about falsehood in this world doesn't matter what source it is, whether it's a false religion, uh, whether it's our media, whether it's politicians, it doesn't matter what it is, falsehood, there's another element that we see here that's true that comes out because of the, because of the embodiment of falsehood in, the, in this false prophet, is it despises the truth. It despises the truth. You know, we live in a, in a world that's dominated by a, a media, politicians, and all that that hates the truth. It's amazing how many times narratives move away cover up avoid the truth of a story it happens every day 24 7 all the time almost all the media is driven by covering up the truth not revealing the real story not revealing the whole story not revealing the truth religion is often very much that same way i will tell you what i want you to know but don't you dig for yourself. Don't you look in God's word for yourself. The Christian says, look in God's word. Look at all of it. Look at Christ. We have nothing to hide. Look at him and see what he has for your life. Look at him and see who he is. Look at us. We're not perfect. We have terrible issues that we deal with, but we have Christ who is helping us and transforming us. False Falsehood, false religion despises the truth. Verse 14 in this chapter. And by the signs it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. The false prophet will be guided. His, his operation of, of, the method of operation will be deception. He will be deceptive in everything that he does. He will hide his true agenda, the agenda of the Antichrist. He will hide his true motives. He will hide the evil that is behind everything that he's doing. You can believe it. As, we, as you look at movies, as you look at online, as you look at TV shows, there is an agenda underneath and hidden behind all those things. There, there are leaders in offices that, are, that have put these movies together, put these TV shows together, put this online content together, professors who have put content together who, who don't want you to see the whole story, who have packaged information in such a way, presenting it as truth, and yet it's not. We live in a world that is deceptive. It comes from Satan himself. The false prophet will be that way. He would deceive the whole world. Verse 9, we see in chapter 12, the great dragon was thrown down out of heaven and the ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, and he is the deceiver of the whole world. You can pretty much count on it if you're watching a movie, watching a TV show. 
you're watching a program, you're seeing content online from many sources, you can almost count on it. There's deception built in there some way. That's why it's tr that's why it's so important that believers would be agents of truth, that we'd be authentic, that we'd be genuine, that we'd be honest, that we are an open book. We present Jesus Christ, we present our failings, but we present our weakness, his strength, his ability, the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, what he calls us from and what he calls us to. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, these kind of men, falsehood, they are false apostles, they're deceitful, they disguise themselves, they're always having to disguise themselves. If I, if I can't tell you the truth, I will have to disguise who I am. I would disguise here in religion. Religions disguise themselves as benevolent, as good, as followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ, but not, not the Jesus Christ of God's Word. A twisted version of Jesus Christ. And so I present that to, to you. I disguise who I really am, the, the, say, the sinful influences that are behind what I'm doing. Why? Because Satan himself, you know, Satan himself, he's constantly having to disguise who he really is. He's an angel of light. Now, as we come towards the end of the tribulation, he'll no longer disguise himself. As he's throwing down, he's going to come out in full force. He was, he's going to reveal through the Antichrist and the false prophet who he is. And with a vengeance, he will take over this world. And he says, you know what? His servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Isn't that amazing, that terminology? We live in a world that is sin-driven, and yet sinners constantly are at work doing what? Seeking to disguise and present what they do as good for the world, as good for you. If you follow me, this is good in your life. If you, if you consume this, buy this, have this, this is good in your life. What deception. We live in a consumer, materialistic world. We are driven by religions that feed off of our pride, that feed off of, off of our desire to, to want things for ourselves to work our way to heaven when, when the Word of God tells us the truth and says we cannot work our way to heaven. Sin taints every good work, every good thing we would ever do. We need a Savior. We need Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ. His love, His grace, His forgiveness. Whereas Satan and all who follow Him live to disguise who they really are. The devil, John 8, 44, does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. We are called, on the other hand, to destroy arguments. Every lofty opinion that raises itself against the knowledge of God. We are to expose error and present truth. Uh, we are to do it powerfully. We're to do it with confidence. We're to do it with boldness. Yet here's the thing, we're to do it in humility. With humility, we are to display the love of God, the grace of God as we give the truth of God. We're not to beat people up. We're not to bully others with the truth. We are to present it lovingly, prayerfully, in the power of the Spirit, and let God have His way in hearts, your heart and mine. Also, we see in the ministry of the false prophet, the ministry of simply falsehood in this world, false religion, false thinking, false worldviews, whatever that might be, it always defies God's Word. We see that here in verse 14 as we look at the ministry of the false prophet. And so he, he tells the world to make an image for the beast, the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. We talked about that last week. You see, that is in direct violation of God's word because we know the Ten Commandments. We know that God has prohibited us to worship any other God or to make, to make an image of anything in this world and to worship it as God. He prohibits that. And the Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan, will, will raise up this image. This image will be come alive, as it were. This image will be powerful, as it were. This image will have, what? who knows, uh, superhero qualities somehow, some way. We don't know. But the intention of this image being built and everyone having a copy of this image is that it will be worshipped. And as it is worshipped, the Antichrist is worshipped. And Satan behind him is worshipped as well. It, the scripture says it is, we are to worship God and God alone or no one else. This is in direct violation of God's word. False religion, the values of this world will call you to compromise your biblical standards every time. When I go down the road, in subtle ways at first, 
And then when it takes over my life, when I go down that road and I begin to compromise, it will destroy my life and my testimony. We must be so careful what we are encouraging our children to do, to believe, to watch, to take in. We must guide them, pray for them, love them, model to them Christ, be agents of grace ourselves. How important. We're to grow in knowing Jesus Christ. That's how we counter this. There are some things, the word of, in Paul's letters, or how about the word of God, that are hard to understand. Yes? Yes. Which the ignorant and the unstable, in other words, sinners, twist to their own destruction. As they do other scriptures, we come to the word of God, and if sin, if I'm not a child of God, I will twist the word of God to my, to my means and to my end. Satan was a master of doing that. He twisted the word of God right in front of Jesus Christ when he tried to tempt him. You can believe that everything he does, he's trying to twist the good of Scripture and use it for deceitful purposes. Take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. As soon as I let error into my life, I lose stability in my walk with Christ. I lose the foundation that holds me firm. I lose the ability to discern. But grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Another thing that the false prophet does as it portrays false religion and falsehood in this world is it captures the imagination. Folks, it powerfully does this. We see it in verse 13 and 14. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And then it tells them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Folks, how powerful is that? An apparent resurrection, which we talked about last week, last week, he doesn't really die. He appears to die. That's powerful, folks. And he's able to call fire down from heaven just like, the, just like the prophets of old in the Old Testament. And so he has power, transformative power. That's what happens. You know what? And we just get, we just get, we get drunk with a possibility of power in our life that can transform. If we can be a part of transformative uh, ability in this world, and I can be part of a group that is transforming our culture or our history or, or people around me. Boy, that, can, that just fills me because it's about me. And yet, all of these things, no matter how transformative they are, if they're without Christ, if they're not for the sake of Christ, if they're not done in the person of Jesus Christ, the end of all these things will be the same. Separation from and destruction from Jesus Christ. The false prophet also, what he does is captivating. Falsehood, false religion, the world, the, the views of this world, the, the, the emphases of what's being put out in our media, what, how the world wants you to function, the way it wants you to operate, what it wants you to believe, what it wants you to give yourself to, the point of view it wants you to embrace. All these things can be so captivating. But there's always a cost. There's always a line that's going to ask you to cross and if you cross that or unmask the truth if you reveal it for who it really is what it's what its true intentions are folks there's trouble it's true today it will be true here chapter 13 verse 15 it was allowed to give breath the false prophet was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and like I, like I said a, a, a superhuman quality somehow. Now today that's not as surprising as it would have been a generation or generations ago. We see artificial life elements coming coming to technology more and more all the time. We see things in, in other countries. We see things here. and We see uh, uh, the possibility of holograms. And we see the possibility of machines that can speak and, and look like human beings. And we see all these things. And, we, and there's technology in the military forces that could maybe be a part of this, uh, this, this, uh, this beast's ability. And we see all these things that now can be, oh, I can see that. I can see We have movies that portray all those things. But this, the world still is going to be astonished when they see the reality of this beast come to life. In a world where we live with superhumans, superheroes, all these things that's portrayed in the media, the world will still be astonished and captivated by the reality, the realism of this image coming to life and what it can do. It will be a deadly consequence for rejection. We see this in verse 15. 
that image that it might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. The false prophet will cause those, the image will cause those who will not worship it to be slain. Will it slay itself? Uh, will it call out and, and demand? Will it be a force in this world? It looks like it. That's what we see. So there'll be a deadly consequence for rejection. You know, we see it more and more. We see we, sent, we see censorship. We see shame. We see uh, privilege being taken away. We see opportunity being taken away. If we dare speak against the truth of the culture, if we dare speak against the 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 mindset, the worldview of the accepted worldview of the culture, folks, the consequences are getting stronger and stronger. Retribution is getting stronger and stronger. In the tribulation, it'll be absolute, especially in the second half of the tribulation. I'll tell you what, today we need to stand on truth. And here's the last thing that, that false religion, falsehood does. It forces you to choose. It forces you into an alliance against Jesus Christ. All false, all false religion rejects Jesus Christ as to who he really is. We saw that last week out of 1 John, and the scriptures are full of that. It rejects the Jesus Christ, the revealed Jesus Christ, the very living word of the Bible. It transforms Jesus into an image they want, not into who is presented from the word of God. Verse 16. It causes all, both great and small, the false prophet. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. It demands a commitment. This world demands a commitment from you. It wants a commitment from you. And if you and I will not give the world the commitment it wants, we're going to be in trouble. America is changing. And it will continue to change. Are you prepared? Are you ready as a believer to take a stand for Jesus Christ? The world now is ready and willing to shame you, to mark you, to censor you, to deny you, to cut you out of opportunity. Are you and I, are, are, are we going to compromise to so that we're accepted in this world? To get ahead in this life, are we going to need to compromise? Are we willing to do that? What's going to be the cost of my commitment to this world? What's the cost of the commitment you've made in your life already? There's a cost that Jesus Christ calls us to. There's a cost that the world calls us to. Which cost will I embrace? Falsehood always demands a commitment or choice away from Jesus Christ. Falsehood wants to control you with that commitment so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. You know... One of the greatest forms of persecution ever invented in this world will be this mark right here. <clears throat> With this mark, it will control the false prophet, the Antichrist, will control who can buy, who can sell. It will control everything in your life. It can take away, it can give. That's the, that's the, that's the reality of what we see here. Our world, sin in this world, those who are leaders in this world who are driven by sin, they now have the power to take away things in your life. They have the power to, the power to make your life miserable as a Christian. They have a, a, a power to, to mark you as, as tainted, as bigoted, as hateful. They have the power to take away your voice. How will we respond as Christians? Are we going to fight back? Are we going to get angry? Or with humility, are we going to stand with courage and boldness on the truth of God's Word? Are we going to show grace and yet lovingly declare the truth? Are we going to model Jesus Christ and His character to a world that's hating us more and more? That's what we're called to do. And if we're willing to do that, it may destroy us. Because falsehood ultimately wants to destroy the truth. It wants to destroy you, the Christian. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It is the number of a man and his number is 666. Boy, books, movies, and everything have been written about that. It's hard to determine what that exactly means and what that is. We know that's, that six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Seven is, is the number of God. It is the creation. It is the fullness of God, the perfection of God, and he rested on the seventh day. Seven is the number that's, that's applied to everything that is perfect and whole. Man can never acquire that. Man is tainted in everything that he does by sin. 
At six is a reminder to man that he is created by God. He sinned and fell out of relationship to God. It is a reminder that we are man and we are not God and that we need a Savior. It is multiplied in triplets here. And I tell you what, uh, to say any more than that, he says here, John himself says, it's going to take wisdom to understand what this means. But when we get to that time, I believe that everyone in this world will know exactly what that number is, what that mark is. Without qualification, it will be clear what is being asked and what is being called. That's the, that's the choice. Worshiping the Antichrist, it's just it's not just a matter of religious deception. It's a matter of life. The world will follow the beast, not just because they're enamored by him. You know, he's powerful. Not because they're deceived by the false prophet. Not because they fear death. But because they feel as though they don't have any choice. But you know what? We always have a choice. Jesus Christ. God warns us, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his head, his forehead, or his hand, he will drink of the wine of God's wrath. Pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. To receive the mark of the beast is to receive falsehood, is to align myself with falsehood. What about you and I today? Have we, are we compromising? Are we making choices in our life that are contrary to the truth of God's Word? Are we allowing ourselves to participate in things that are contrary to the truth of God's Word? To the truth of the character of Jesus Christ. We need to be always so careful what's in our life. Jesus clearly reminds us if we deny Him, He will deny us before His Father. He will say, depart from me. I never knew you because our life will be, have been defined by falsehood. If my life is defined by faith in Christ, by faith in His truth, by living for His truth, I will be united with Jesus Christ and a child of His. How do we deal with falsehood today? How do we deal with uh, false narratives today? How do we deal with those things today? We're not going to be here during the tribulation, I pray, that you won't be. But how do we deal with that today? Well, we have to be on guard. Always, we must always be on guard. Colossians, Paul tells us, see to it that no one, don't let anyone take you captive by philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, the elemental spirits of this world that follow follow your own follow your own heart. You know, anything's possible in your life. You just pull up your bootstraps and you can make it happen. Be true to yourself. All these things are, are falsehood. We need Christ. We need a Savior. He defines us. He gives us purpose in life. Your children, your grandkids are being taught things in schools today that, that are false. Teachers are to be respected, but the, but the leadership of, of teachers today are driven by agendas, are driven by, by a mission, by goals that is no longer oriented towards Christ. It is, it is driven for agendas that pull the world away from Christ. Your kids will encounter that in school and college it is happening constantly, every day, with force. And we must always be on guard. We need to be careful not to live out of control. Be controlled by our emotions and our feelings. In Ephesians 4, where G, uh, Paul speaks to the church, what the church is supposed to be. He puts a warning in, this, in there, and he says to the church, Don't be children. Don't act like children. Children are great. Children are awesome. I love the humility and the innocence of children, but you know what? Children also don't have discernment. We're not to be like children, tossed to and fro, back and forth by the way. It's carried about by every wind, every opinion, every point of view of doctrine, and by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Folks, we're not to be yanked back and forth and back and forth. And when we're in God's Word, we learn that we don't have to be out of control. We can be grounded in His truth. Um, being jerked back and forth constantly. How many how many believers do I see that are constantly being jerked back and forth between obedience, disobedience, and faithfulness and, and unfaithfulness and the character of Christ and the sins of the Spirit and God's way and my way. And when I'm out of control, I've, my eyes are not on Jesus Christ. My eyes are not on His Word. They are on what I want, when I want it, how I want it. And my life is a mess. 
I need to address falsehood in my life by being grounded in God's word. I got to take God's word and apply it in my life. That's where discernment becomes real. Hebrews tells us solid food, that's the word of God, the study of God's word, is for the mature. I gain maturity as I study the word of God. It's for those who have the powers, their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. A believer, a true, authentic child of God is constantly putting the Word of God into practice in their life, applying it in their life, always engaging the information and this, and what's coming at them through the grid of, is this truth? Is this error? How do I handle what's being given to me? How do I handle what's, what's being presented to me? We handle it with an understanding of the Word of God and of Jesus Christ and who He is. From that, we learn discernment. As we read the Word of God, then we go into our day and we apply what God's been teaching us. And we apply it to the things that we are encountering as we go through the day. We ask the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom to, to walk through the day and to honor you with truth. We evaluate everything through God's Word. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe every opinion. Don't believe every worldview. Don't believe everything that you hear. But test those things. Test the spirits to see whether they are what? From God. Folks, when you're watching that movie and watching that show and you're online and you're looking at that content and you're in class and you're hearing the professor speak and teach, we sh you should always be thinking, how does this line up with the Word of God? Is this calling me away from Christ or is it encouraging Christ in my life? That ought to be the final determination in your life as you, as you encounter life in the world around you. Pursue God's truth for your life. Love His truth. The time is coming, 2 Timothy tells us, when people won't endure God's teaching anymore. Sound teaching. But will have itching ears, which means they want to accumulate to themselves teachers who tell them what they want to hear, their own passions. And so they turn away from listening to the truth and they wander, wander off in the midst. In falsehood and false teaching and false religion, it does exactly that. It speaks to, to what the person wants to hear, what not what they need to hear. It presents a Christ that they want to fashion and form after their image, but not the Christ that we need to see. So we need to love God's truth and we need to pursue it with our own life. We need to endure and want sound teaching. Folks, the Word of God needs to be in your life on a regular basis. Be a student of God's Word and be a person who lives it out. Listen with your heart to what the Word of God is saying to you. And I want you to know that the Word of God will free you in your life. Jesus said to the Jews who believed Him, to everyone who believes Him, if you abide, if you, if you are immersed in the Word of God and it's immersed in your life, if you abide in my Word, you are truly mine. You are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. You will know what is true. Not just information, but what is true and how to live and how to respond to life. You will know what is true. And that truth will set you free. You know, to, to yield to God's word is to, is to be set free. It's to be set free from anything else that would capture my attention and capture my focus and, and draw me to its commitment and then to be put into bondage and become my master in my life. God's, worth, God's Word will free me from the defeat of every sin that would plague my soul. It's not going to make me sin less. It will give me the power to overcome. It will give me the, the power to have victory in Christ. It frees me. God's Word promises to free you. Folks, I want you to know right now that if you commit your life, your soul to the Word of God, to the person of Jesus Christ, he will free you from the things that plague you right now. He doesn't promise to change your circumstances, but He will free you by freeing your mind, your soul, your heart. He will give you the ability to have perspective that is divine, that is godly, that is, that is the character of Christ, to walk through any adversity, any challenge in your life, and, and to experience the peace and the freedom of God in doing that. Folks, that is power. We need to reinforce Christ and Godly living in our life. If anyone teaches a different doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, okay, that's what we need to be committed to. Words that reinforce Christ, the character of Jesus Christ, and words that ultimately bring a godliness into my life. We're told in Peter, 
God made this promise to you. Second Peter chapter one, verse three, I have given you every, everything, everything that you need for life and for godliness. It's his truth, it's his character. That is the way that we fight falsehood in our life. We need to encourage this faithfulness because there is a day coming. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And that day ultimately is the day of accountability. But you know, that day might be, might be the day of the choice that you need to make that's the most important choice in your life. You know, there are choices that we make that define the rest of our life. There are, choice, there are choices that are, are yet to be made in your life that would define the trajectory of the rest of your life. Are you ready now? Will that choice be empowered by the Spirit of God? Will that choice be grounded in the truth of God's Word? Will you be committed? Are you developing that now? Are you training now to understand God's Word, to use it in your life? Are you training to be, a, to be uh, applying His Word faithful in your life? Are you putting it into action? Is it your desire right now? To reflect Jesus Christ? That is being ready for that day. The battle's real. This is it, folks. The battle's real. Take care, brothers, sisters, all of us, lest there be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. See, when I but I don't believe God's word when I say, you know, eh, when I compromise, oh no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna obey today. No, that's not for me. No, I'm not going to church today. No, I'm not gonna open my word. No, I'm not going to pray. No. When we do all that, unbelief is in my heart. I'm saying to God, I don't believe that that step of obedience, I don't believe that your word is worth it. I don't believe it's worth changing my life. I'm not, I'm not ready to change. I'm not willing to change. That's unbelief. It is evil. Take care, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Unbelief always causes me to fall away, to wander away. Exhort one another instead, every day, every day, every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you might be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If there's a word that could be applied to the falsehood of today, it's deceitfulness. Folks, you can't trust what's being presented to you. You can't trust what you're being taught. you got to come back to the Word of God. The Word of God is truth. You can trust the Word. It is true in every generation. It applies in every generation. There's not a generation that it is not truth for, that it is not practical for, that it is not transformative in. The Word of God, its principles are true in every generation, to every culture, to every people. It is truth for our life. It needs to be the grid through which everything passes. We need to encourage one another every, every day. The battle is real. Trust you are ready to engage that battle because you're committed to Jesus Christ, his character in your life, and because you're committed to the truth. If not, come back to his word and repent. Repent of a mindset that has pulled you away from Christ. Repent of a commitment to error that, is, that has wrecked havoc in your life. Ask God to help you change that pattern in your life so that that pattern now honors the Lord and pleases the Lord. Ask the Lord to change you. Ask the Lord to give you a passion to love His Word, to love His truth, and to be committed to that. Falsehood will destroy your life and mine if I do not put the grid of God's Word over my life and over my heart. If I do not put the character and the person of Jesus Christ around everything that I do. May God help us. May God help me. I need help in this today, and so do you. Revelation 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet, the two most powerful individuals that will ever live in history, apart from Jesus Christ. And he is your victory. Turn to him today. Thanks for joining with us again. We'll continue next week. We're looking forward to it. It's been a delight to meet with you. May God bless you and move your heart towards him today. I pray. We'll see you then.